Hi, my name is Michael Lerner. I teach uh, physics at Beechwood High School outside of Cleveland, and I'm here to present about two words that I think helped me change my identity from a novice to an expert physics teacher. Now, these two words are not research-based or best practice. These two words are just words that resonated with my own personal experience. I'm curious as to whether you find these useful. In fact, I really hope to get feedback as to whether these words sort of make sense of how you became a better physics teacher or if they don't seem to make any sense to you at all. And I'm really focusing here on the planning aspect of being a teacher. Like how do we know what we're gonna do, when and why? When I first started teaching, it was all about the lesson plan. I was a first year teacher with no training at all. And I would spend hours trying to figure out how I would fill those 50 minutes in class. And it was a constant yawning hole of things that I had to fill. And in those first couple of years, I started realizing I needed to have units, that these lesson plans were building up to something. And graduate school was a great way to learn how to plan a unit. But it was only after I got out of graduate school and was in teaching in the trenches for a couple of years that I started realizing that part of my job was to collect moves. Now, to me, a move is something you don't always do in your lesson. If it's something you'd always do, it's, it's part of what you write down in your lesson plan. It's those things you do 99% of the time or 1% of the time. It's those reactive things that you do. And sometimes they're really general. Jeremy Seacard did a great presentation last year about the various Socratic dialogue moves you can have. And boy, do I use those all the time. There's also ones that are particularly specific to particular lesson plans. Let me give you an example. Here's a relatively boring lesson I do most years, not all years, where I give students this situation with a couple of books, some tape and a table, and I ask them to draw interaction diagrams and force diagrams for different objects. Now, I call them interaction diagrams. You might have heard them as system schema. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, pause the video like right now and go look up system schema. They very well may change your whole teaching idea. But the interaction diagrams that students normally draw for this situation would look something like this. It would be a fair number of normal and gravitational interactions. Some years though, I have a move where I go whisper into somebody, instead of doing the table, instead of doing the top book, will you draw a force diagram, interaction diagram, for the piece, the roll of tape inside the tape dispenser. And you get an interaction diagram and a force diagram that looks like this. And this is fantastic for those years where you keep getting the question, should I put the ice skates as part of the ice skater? Because there really are a lot of choices as to what we see as an object. And this makes it very explicit. What is the object? What is the thing that we think of as having no parts? And it depends on what problem we're trying to solve. I normally think of clothes as part of the object of a person, but kids sometimes don't. My students sometimes don't. And this is great because here's something that they know has parts, but everybody will perceive as an object unless you explicitly tell them to look at a smaller part. I mean, honestly, I don't think of my teeth as separate objects, but boy, does my orthodontist. So that's what I mean by a move. But it took until really about Nine years ago, when I started getting into modeling instruction to understand the concept of a storyline. Now, in modeling instruction and in a lot of other reform pedagogies, uh, the storyline is thought of as how you connect the units together, the story you're telling to students. But to be honest, the reason I like the word storyline is it's an evocative metaphor for not only the stories I'm telling, but the stories students are telling to themselves. And there's a lot of stories I want a student to talk to about themselves. There's a lot of them that you might choose. There's things like being able, uh, that, that physics is a collaborative process, that physics is about solving problems, that there's more than one way to solve the problem, that uh, uh, algebra is important. And these are all great stories, but you don't necessarily, every teacher tell, wants all of their students to tell all the same stories. And picking and choosing what story is really important. And I realized this when I started worrying about the AP Physics 1 curriculum. And in part of me modifying my teaching to become a better AP Physics 1 teacher, I wrote the world famous watermelon on wheels 
knife problem. Now, it's not actually world famous. It's a running joke I have. Uh, I always call it world famous, although I honestly think it should be used more often than it is. And it's a regular, simple collision problem. And I wrote it in such a weird state that a watermelon on wheels and a knife seem to be the most obvious objects to collide. And what makes this problem interesting to me is that I give them different systems to solve the problem with. The net external force on the knife and the net external force on the watermelon on wheels knife system. And I give them all the information. It's not a conservation of momentum problem. And it's great to watch how this builds the storyline that I care about at this point. One, there's more than one way to solve the problem. And two, the system you pick really matters. The number of students who, when they first see this, get an answer of zero for part A is astounding because they see a collision. And I think the system has to be the watermelon on wheels and the knife. And it doesn't. I want the force on the knife. I just want to track the momentum of the knife. And I love the number of students who do question B and do all the math for it. And then other students go, it has to be zero. It's a collision. It's conservation of momentum. There's more than one way to solve the problem. And I think they're all really valid. And this really helps tell a story that I think all AP Physics 1 teachers should be telling. So what are my takeaways from this? One, these words are overwhelming to a novice teacher. I understand why in graduate school, I didn't think about all the possible moves or had people tell me all the possible moves for their lesson plans or to start talking about these overarching goals for the year. But on the other hand, they dictate my lesson plan and make my life easier. Listen, I am impressed with high school physics teacher Twitter. I love all the ideas that you have. Knowing what my storylines are, what the stories I want my students to tell themselves that make sense for my group of students, makes it easy to figure out which lessons I would do and which lessons I wouldn't. And I, I think it's a great way to sort of filter out all this information that we get. I also think, especially as you're becoming from a novice teacher, as you're moving to becoming a more expert teacher, stockpiling moves is an important move. And so obviously I say all of you should revisit Jeremy C. Carr's uh, Socratic dialogue moves. But figuring out these moves and writing down these moves has been a really powerful thing for my own teaching. I have so many notes about various things I've done for different lesson plans that I now have in a back pocket so that I know that uh, each day I can be more reactive and more responsive to what my individual students need. And my last takeaway is I think we should be talking more about our moves and our storylines and less about our units and our lesson plans. I've seen lots of great lesson plans on uh, Twitter, but they're not that useful to me. I'm really curious as to the individualized idiosyncratic things that you have to do to help with your students that you don't do all the time. And I'm also really interested about what are the major goals and how do you get to those major goals, which often ends up happening in those tiny moves we do with our kids. I'm curious now, does this resonate? I really hope I get to talk to a lot of you high school physics teachers about whether these two words, as they did for me, help encapsulate how you went from being a novice teacher to an expert. Thank you.